Hey guys, I'm Dr. William Summers. I've been practicing OBGYN in Birmingham, Alabama for the past 30 years. In the past several years, I've extended my practice to include patients for weight management. Now, this is the second video intended to provide educational sources for my patients who attend the weight clinic, or really for anyone who might find them helpful. But this is the unplanned video, and yet this is the one I wish I could spread to many ears. Now I know the power of social media, but I am that guy who needs help navigating Instagram just to find my grandson's pictures. So going viral is, has always meant something different to me. And, and in that respect, I wish that I could pour DNA polymerase all over this video. So I mentioned in my first video that a first year medical student had approached me and asked me, what is the most significant thing that had changed? since I had been in practice. And I answered her that I believe it is the increasing to almost absolute control that an insur com insurance companies have on patients that either directly or indirectly manipulate the way that I practice medicine. And after I gave her that answer, I reflected on that and started connecting these dots. Now, in 2005, I went to a solo GYN practice, kind of in a mindset, I know enough, I'll just do what I've been doing. And I met a patient very early on that just by necessity, I had to see her clinically more and more frequently, so I got to know her real well. She is the kind of patient every doctor loves to have. I mean, she is bright, she told the funniest stories. You know, I felt badly the way I was dressed. She, she would wear her best clothes, show me her new earrings, and. Things were going great until one Saturday morning when I was reviewing labs from the previous day, I realized that her kidney tests were severely abnormal and just days earlier, they were completely normal. So I called this patient and I called her family and, and informed her that she needed to come to the hospital. And they were more comfortable with me admitting her. So I said, okay, I'll admit you. And the next day I had full intention to transfer her to an appropriate consultant. But they drove in, I met them at the circle drive of the hospital. It was after hours, the, 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 these doors were locked. I hit this door opener to let them in and I admitted her. But suddenly I found that I was in a different place, a, a place that I didn't know enough and I definitely need to improve in what I was doing. So after she was admitted, I scrambled back and forth from my office, back to her room, trying to search for any reason that would explain this sort of sudden change. And I really came up with nothing. And I just decided to start all over and go back through. And I went to her room and I got her bag of medicines and I emptied them out. And there was one medicine that she had failed to mention and that was not included on her medicine list on the forms of admission. And I ran back to my office and searched this medicine and there was a rare side effect that actually explained every reason that we were in the hospital that night. And so I kind of took this, I don't know enough, I need to improve what I'm doing. It's, it's, it's such a better place for me. I mean, it's such a much more productive place for me. And I remember that, you know, the great philosopher Socrates once said, I know that I'm intelligent because I know that I know nothing. I, I find it odd now that I found it odd in 2005 when I went into solo practice and started managing patients for weight loss, that I did not really have the tools for the fundamental lifestyle change, step one, that was absolutely necessary for any sustainable results for a patient managing their weight and goals for weight loss. So I decided I would just sort of this, this, this tool that was empty in my toolbox, I decided I had found the perfect answer. That I found a lab, a cardiovascular lab in Birmingham that would run lab results at no extra cost, but included a free nutritionist that was available to any person that had the lab run. And as I informed every patient, hey, you're gonna get this free nutritional consult. It's specific, individualized to your lab results. I told them about it, sent them their results in the mail, a letter, please call this nutritionist. And that was going to solve the problem for me regarding covering the step. I was going to do what I was told more informed to do, and that would be 
any medicines or applications here and perhaps any referrals to surgery. So I started leaning back in medical school. 1982, in my second year, there was introduced by our biochemistry professor a new course in nutrition. And, and I find it odd now that I didn't find it odd then when he, when he introduced this as a course that would provide the, that first step in any clinical situation, but that it was new. And very few medical schools at all even included this course. And the passion delivered in the introduction of this course was apparently lost because we didn't, I didn't use this in my clinical training, my residency, and haven't used it for 30 years. And so now, I find it odd, when I reflect back on 30 years, that there is one value on a patient's chart that's been there for 30 years, that one value that I am not required to explain when it's abnormal, and that is the patient's weight. The BMI is on every chart, and whether it was a, a blood pressure or a clinical finding or lab or radiograph, I was required to explain it, repeat it, manage it, or refer it. Every single number except for one for 30 years, and that was a patient's BMI. So it's not odd to me now that obesity has risen from 12% when I was in medical school to near 36% here in the South, and one state at 38%, and that obesity has become the second leading cause of preventable deaths only behind cigarette smoking. Well, I, I find it Odd now that I never found it odd before when I think about insurance companies' denial of including these fundamental steps for patients for weight management. You know, for many, many years, discussing any patient obese was just considered a character flaw, it's their fault, it, go deal with it. And but, but in 2013, after these types of conversations in 2013, Obesity was classified as a disease, as more and more discoveries about hormonal and genetic factors contributing to this disease. So in 2013, this disease was put into the book of diseases, and yet it remains the one page in this book of diseases that is not covered by insurance companies. So it's, it's not odd to me at all that just as obesity has risen, the complications associated with it account for 20% of the entire health budget, over $150 billion a year. And that, that to me is a conservative estimate because of the misogyny and the double standard in our culture with women and the associated psychosocial sexual issues associated with obesity. They're not even included in that number. It's, n it's not odd to me at all now that we see diabetes going from 2% to 10% approaching 20% in the next several years. And then it seemed odd to me then, and even odd to me now, when insurance companies said, well, let's do something about it, they started paying for surgery only. And where all disciplines are looking for ways for less invasive procedures, lower risk procedures, to have quality outcomes with, with more conservative managements, the surgery and obesity management is skyrocketing because the patients are told, this must be the best. My insurance will pay for this. And now I get this patient that should seem odd to everyone because a patient comes to me when they're required to have this six-month management and weight loss. They come to me and say, doctor, I'll see you for six months. Please don't help me. One got mad because she lost weight disqualifying her for surgery. So now... Going back to the patients that I thought I had the perfect solution. I found a lab providing this nutrition consult for every person, no charge. And this could be done in person. It could be done over the phone. It could be done before work hours, after work hours, even on Saturday. And I was so eager when I drove to this lab to get the results of the first 1,000 patients that I sent lab work to see if I could correlate some type of assessments that I could use for future patients. And I get there thinking I'm going to review 1,000 patients and only 30 people took advantage of the free nutritionist. And I, and I was blown away, and now I found it odd that I was blown away because why would they think it's important? Obviously, doctors don't think it's important. We don't discuss it ever with a patient. Medical schools don't think it's important. We didn't get trained in this step one. Early education, public high schools and, 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 and elementary and, and middle schools don't think it's important. We didn't have any literacy in nutrition. And obviously, insurance companies don't think it's important. We don't re reimburse for that. Basically, we have sent a loud message. It's your fault. It's not our problem. Figure it out. Deal with it. And basically, because of who you are, 
we're going to treat you differently. We're, you're not like the other diseases. You you get to be treated differently. You know, I say about this book as a kid, connect the dots. All the dots are on the page. They're easy to assemble and just find a result. And I think there's a message that we there are dots on all the pages of our lives that should be examined. Because Socrates himself said, an unexamined life is a life not worth living. And to me, I think he's saying connect the dots. That we all have different dots in our lives. And I started reflecting on my career as a doctor for 30 years and how many patients I've seen and talked to that have come to me and have been dismissed in doctor's offices or in clinical settings because of their weight. Some I referred for orthopedic evaluations and reproductive evaluations that were when they entered just say go lose weight. And, and, and I acknowledge that, but I never acted on it. And I owe them an apology. If I go back to the highlight of my graduation from, from medical school, I talked about this in uh, my first video, but the unexpected highlight was when our class stood up and we were handed a piece of paper to read the oath of Hippocrates, the father of medicine. And, and we start reading these words, it gets very, very serious, because I think individually we're all sort of overwhelmed with this the words on the page realizing every doctor that has ever come before us has read these same words and it's not at all, at all where we've been but this privileged charge of where we're all going and if anybody remembers any words from this creed you'll remember first do no harm discrimination to me the the, the ugliest word in the human language is much greater than four letters it's basically telling someone, some group, because of who you are, you're not worthy. And because of who you are and your unworthiness, then you can be treated differently than everyone else. And the evil in that is perhaps the biggest evil in all social parameters that have ever existed. The evil of which if it could be eliminated would probably have all other social strata just fall in place. And in recent weeks, while thinking about filming this video, I have asked patients in my clinic, sometimes individuals and sometimes in groups, if they have ever felt mistreated in a clinical setting, a doctor's office, a hospital, or lab, mistreated because of their weight. And unsuspecting, I have had the most unbelievable, overwhelming stories from people. The, the, the faces, the fractured faces, the tears, the heartache, and describing experiences, not, not in public places, not in fashion boutiques, not in airline seats, in the doctor's offices, and the clinical settings. It's been blistering to hear. And we think about the, the walls of the medical institutions should harbor a place of safety for anyone disenfranchised. It should not be the source of that person, never. We all see, all doctors, see patients who've been told they're unworthy, knocked down, disenfranchised, marginalized, and, and maybe we don't have a medicine or a surgery for them, but it, it may just be the best medicine, it's free, it's certainly not generic, just to tell that person, I, I, that you're awesome. And it's truth they are. And, and because a person who has come in and says, I am unworthy because who I am, has no place to go. They can only say, I can't. And by reaffirming and validating their real value may just be the inch that they would have to realize that there is a new strategy and a new pathway to continue with their greatness. So I want to go back to 2005, my patient that I met early in my career, that I called to the hospital who had abnormal kidney tests. She arrived late and I met her at the hospital doors because the hospital main doors were already closed. She and her family pulled into the circle drive and I had to keep adding and let her in. Except I had to wait a while after I hit the door opening because it took her a while because she was actually too large to actually walk. She had a, had a sister with a wheelchair. 
she was wearing her best clothes, one of two oversized t-shirts, and she had on the same earrings from a thrift store. And I had been calling her all day, begging her, and finally convinced her to come to the hospital. But in the business I was seeing earlier, when I was seeing her, we're at her house. I had been notified by some family and friends of hers that she had given up on going to a doctor's office or a hospital because of the way it made her feel. And as badly as she felt that day, it was not near as bad in her mind how she would feel coming back to a hospital or doctor's office. And it wasn't verbal shaming, it was body language shaming. Checking in at an administrative desk or, or the, the people in the hallways and the lab and the x-ray technicians, the eye rolling and the way that she was disengaged while other people all around her were totally engaged. It was an evil that she felt. And like the dots of these circumstances before her, and one of the biggest dots in my early career, I owe her an apology. Because I, I, I acknowledged that. I knew what was going on with her and didn't speak out. Because with, with increasing this knowledge from going from this place, I don't know enough. I need to know what I'm doing. I need to, to expand knowledge. It creates a place where I do at least know enough right now where I must do something, and that's called passion. I know the integrity of the systems of our medical institutions are the best in the world. And I believe in the, that, that just recognizing what is being created, that something can be done. I believe we all exist in a very good comfort zone. I know enough, I'll just do what I've been doing. And I would just want to push that into a, I don't know enough, I know I need to be doing more. And somewhere in those discussions, if this could land on somebody's desk or conference room table to create a place where somebody could feel like they must do something in, the, in a form of passion, then, then that would be my desire for this video to go as viral as viral would take it. And, and so I realized that within the health institutions and the allied sciences with the public educators and legislators, that we can form goals and plans of change and institutions that will bring us out of this place of evil, but we can all be at the circle drive of the insurance companies, you're going to have to hit the button on the door to let us in, because we can no longer accept that we're not worthy to be treated the same. We are the exact place where unequivocally, absolutely, we prove equality to everyone just by the genetic coding and the sequencing of our DNA is the same. And everyone deserves that respect. And it's, it's not odd at all, not odd at all to me at all, that two of the greatest figures in the last generation had their own dots to connect in their own lives to create such greatness for the world, had this one dot that connected them. Albert Einstein, the world will not be destroyed by those who do evil, but by those who watch them without doing anything. And Dr. Martin Luther King, to ignore evil is to become an accomplice to it. The evil, when we recognize it, needs to be changed, discrimination eliminated off the planet, and certainly in the place where evil has no place, but only a safety and a refuge for anyone that ever experiences that from anyone else. Thanks for watching.